So I would like now to, again, th this is another talk on research. I'd like to invite uh, Jessica, Dr. Jessica Vlischek Caroline. Um, Jess uh, is a nuclear chemist, a researcher, a colleague, um, a role model to a more junior scientist. I know that for a fact. Um, she works at the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization. Most of her research is on how to separate, manage, treat uh, the spent nuclear fuel. Uh, and I believe some of your research has been uh, now even transferred to non-nuclear application. And it's a great example of how advancement in nuclear research can actually lead to advancement in other areas. I believe it's water treatment in particular in your case. Well, thank you and welcome. The research group that I work in, the Nuclear Fuel Cycle Research Group at ANSTO, uh, so the work we do in improving the safety and sustainability of the nuclear fuel cycle. So first of all, just a brief introduction into what is the nuclear fuel cycle. So uh, we start with mining, milling and enrichment of uranium, which is then made into fuel. Uh, fuel is put in a reactor, which is safely operated for many years, and then we need to manage the used fuel that's generated. So that can be either by converting it into a waste form for long-term storage and disposal. That's called the open nuclear fuel cycle. Or we can uh, try and separate and recycle the elements that are in used fuel that have the potential to be made back into fuel again. Uh, and that's called the closed fuel cycle. And in theory, we can go round and round many times. So I'm actually going to start talking about the area of the nuclear fuel cycle that I know the least about and work my way towards the stuff that I know the most about. Um, but I want to give a brief overview of the scope of, of things that we do. So first of all, materials for reactors. So Australia is a member of the Generation 4 International Forum, or GIF, uh, which is a group of international scientists who are working on developing next generation, Generation 4 nuclear reactors. These are reactors that don't exist yet, but they're being um, designed for the future to have things like in, uh, great inherent safety, uh, reduced waste production, good proliferation resistance, uh, good economics, and the ability to be integrated into a renewables energy grid. So there are two, there are lots of different types of generation four reactors being designed, but the two that Australia is involved in are the very high temperature reactor and the molten salt reactor. So the very high temperature reactor is exciting because it's probably the furthest along the development scale, closest to being ready to actually to be, be deployed. The molten salt reactor is not as far along that technology readiness level scale, um, but it has some really exciting thermophysical properties and inherent safety features. So in terms of materials for reactors, both for these new generation four reactors and current reactors, they need to be able to withstand really extreme conditions. This includes things like stress, mechanical loads, uh, radiation, corrosion, and high temperatures. But it's very challenging to test materials under these kinds of extreme conditions. So um, at ANSTO in particular, we have some great capabilities and unique infrastructure that allows us to do this kind of testing. In particular, uh, for irradiation, uh, we have the nuclear reactor, we have accelerators, we have hot cell capabilities, which enable that kind of testing to be done. So now moving on to nuclear fuel research. So we do some research looking at current fuels. As Jenny said in her talk just before, most nuclear fuel that's currently used is uranium oxide. Um, so that uranium oxide sits in a fuel pellet, which is inside a nuclear fuel rod surrounded by a cladding material, which is typically zirconium alloy or zircaloy. So um, in terms of current fuels, uranium oxide fuels, what is really interesting with how we can push these forward into the future is can we burn them up for longer? Uh, because if we can leave fuel in a reactor for longer, then uh, we need to change fuel less often. That means less fuel handling, and it also means we generate less waste. Uh, and also, can we integrate nuclear into a renewables grid, which would probably mean load following, where we need to ramp the power of the reactor up and down, um, so, which is different to way, the way that nuclear reactors are typically operated now. So for both of these challenges of high burn-up fuel and load following, one of the major technical issues is uh, called the pellet cladding interaction, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's when the uranium 
oxide fuel pellet starts to interact mechanically and chemically with the zircaloy cladding material, actually with the zirconium oxide layer that's on the surface of the zircaloy cladding, and it forms this mixed uranium zirconium oxide phase. So uh, some of the research that we're doing is looking into really understanding this pellet cladding interaction more. How does it happen? Uh, what are the effects when it does happen on the operation of the fuel and the operation of the reactor? Uh, is it still safe? Because if we understand that really well, then we can start thinking about ways to mitigate it or ways to, um, to ensure that the reactor can still be operated safely even if it's occurring. Uh, and this is work uh, on the pellet cladding interaction that I'm doing collaboratively with Patrick and Ed at the University of New South Wales. We've had a couple of PhD students working on this, um, both one that's just finished and one that's just starting. As well as current fuels, we're also interested in fuels of the future. So there are lots of different kinds that are interesting. Uh, mixed oxide fuels, which are a mixture of uranium oxide and plutonium oxide. The exciting thing about this is that it uses recycled plutonium. So material that was, is otherwise considered a waste, uh, we can instead put it back into fuel and make it into a resource. Um, Non-oxide fuels, which Jenny just gave us an excellent talk about, something like uranium nitride and fuels for generation for reactors. So for example, these very high temperature reactors, which use a different, a slightly different type of fuel uh, to tradi like traditional reactors now, like power uh, pressurized water reactors. So I mentioned before, we have some unique infrastructure at ANSTO that helps us do irradiation studies on materials. Uh, and more broadly, we have a lot of uh, really cool infrastructure at ANSTO, as well as the people with the skills and the knowledge in how to run it. Uh, which enable us to have really good characterization capability. So we have our Opal reactor, uh, the Center for Neutron Scattering, which you've heard a little bit about already, the Australian Synchrotron down in Melbourne, which does the same thing but with X-rays, uh, some really some active laboratory facilities, including hot cells, uh, electron microscopy capability, and computational modeling. So in fact, in terms of nuclear fuel research, um, historically, ANSTO has done a lot of work with modeling nuclear fuel, um, which is great because you don't have to actually handle radioactive material when you're doing modeling, so it's much safer. But we're now interested in really trying to develop more of a capability in synthesis and characterization of nuclear fuel materials. Um, this is, I guess, why I've become more involved in research in nuclear fuel, because I'm a chemist, I like hanging out in a lab, making things and then understanding what it is that I've made. Um, and this is actually really important because one, uh, you need experiments to validate modeling, and two, uh, we're creating a sovereign capability for Australia. So the future of nuclear in Australia means that we want to have the capability to make and understand nuclear fuel. So moving on now, finally, to use fuel, uh, or otherwise known as nuclear waste. So uh, as I said, we've got two options for how to deal with that. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages, of course, to the open and closed fuel cycles. Um, one of the advantages of the open fuel cycle is at the moment it's cheaper to get uranium out of the ground than it is to get it out of used fuel. Uh, you also have to handle the used fuel less if you simply convert it into waste form for long-term storage and disposal. The advantages, on the other hand, of recycling uh, that the waste that you end up with uh, is a lot less hazardous. There's less of it. You have a smaller volume of waste. It lasts a lot shorter time, hundreds of years instead of hundreds of thousands of years, uh, and it's less radiotoxic. Uh, it's, I think it's really important for public perception of nuclear to say that we're looking at recycling this. And it's more sustainable, really, because you're actually getting um, more efficient use out of the energy potential that exists in uranium by using it multiple times. So we do research into both open and uh, closed fuel cycles at ANSTO. So in terms of waste forms, um, there are different types of waste forms that are good for different types of elements. So ceramic materials are really good for actinide elements like uranium and plutonium, uh, whereas glass waste forms are really good at immobilizing fission products like cesium and strontium. And you can combine these together to make glass ceramics, which are good at immobilizing everything that's in used fuel. Uh, and concrete and geopolymers are also uh, interesting for 
low-level wastes. So this is a picture of uh, CINROC technology, which has been developed at ANSTO over decades, uh, which is a powerful technology for ceramics, but also glass and glass ceramics, where you can dramatically reduce the volume of waste for disposal, uh, and also by decreasing the volume, you, in, you make the, the waste form very dense, which makes it very safe for, and, and durable for long-term disposal. And I just want to finish up by talking about the closed fuel cycle research and actinide recycling, which is an area particularly close to my heart, as Patrick said. So um, there is actually already a commercial process for reprocessing uranium and plutonium from used nuclear fuel. It's done in countries like France and Japan. Uh, this is, sorry, all the actinide elements in the periodic table. So yeah, uranium and plutonium, there's an established process. Of course, there's always work in research to improve. Um, but the real next big challenge uh, in terms of closing the fuel cycle is can we recycle these other actinide elements uh, in purple, neptunium, americium, and curium? So there's no known established process for separation and recycling of these from used nuclear fuel uh, because it's a lot more challenging, of course. So I'm interested in trying to achieve this minor actinide separation um, and uh, doing this using uh, solid phase materials to separate out the minor actinides. So the materials that we develop for this need to be incredibly stable because they need to be able to withstand very acidic and very um, high radiation environments. And they also need to be selective uh, because they need to be able to pull out the minor actinides from a solution of used nuclear fuel that has many, 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 many elements in there. So this would work something like what you can see here. You have your solid phase material in a column. Sorry, I've been neglecting the, that side of the room, but you, hopefully you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, you'd flow through a solution of the used nuclear fuel and the minor actinide elements represented in blue are retained by the solid phase material and everything else can simply go straight through. Um, and as Patrick mentioned as well, um, this kind of technology for separations is not only applicable to the nuclear fuel cycle, it's also potentially useful for uh, nuclear medicine, for the mining industry, uh, for environmental remediation, anything where you want to be able to remove one particular element from a complex mixture of elements. So this is just an example of some of the materials that we've developed in the past. Um, that can be used for this. So zirconium phosphonate materials, you can see here some nice um, uh, scanning electron microscopy images showing the elemental distribution in these samples. But uh, basically, uh, this, these kinds of materials combine an inorganic framework, which gives them uh, good stability towards acid and radiation, as well as an organic molecule, which uh, provides the selectivity for the minor actinides. So these zirconium phosphonate materials that we've developed actually show quite good selectivity for the minor actinide separation, which is really exciting. And we're continuing this work in the zirconium phosphonates, both can we make the selectivity even better, but also we want to look at how practical would these materials actually be for treating used nuclear fuel? How do they actually hold up in uh, the presence of high doses of radiation, in the presence of highly acidic solutions? And finally, uh, can we convert the material once it's been used to separate the minor actinides like here? Can we um, simply thermally or heat treat this material to convert it into a zirconium phosphate ceramic, which is then uh, a fuel material that we can put back into the reactor to burn those minor actinides? So, which would be really exciting because then we'd have a single material that's being used to completely close the loop of the nuclear fuel cycle. So I want to finish by thanking uh, all of my colleagues at ANSTO. I've really represented everyone's research, so I will need to thank the entire team, uh, as well as Patrick and Ed from UNSW and the students uh, that I supervise at the University of New South Wales, as well as a host of international collaborators who also are involved in this work. And thank you for listening.